Ricola, necessary aid. And that can pretty much. And they eat not on the diet as well. Welcome, welcome everybody to uh, the Explorers Club tonight, Monday night. My name is Roger Hartle. I'm a, I'm a member here at the Explorer Club, and uh, I, I love these phone calls from Anne when she surprises me with uh, a task. But this task tonight is very, very special, and I'm really honored to be here. Uh, a year ago, Valentine's Day, she asked me to put together a program on heart transplant. I'm a neurosurgeon, but she asked me to put together a program on heart transplant. And that was a lot of fun, and I think it was very, very well received. But tonight is obviously a very, very different topic, and uh, it's a real honor and pleasure for me to introduce uh, Peter von, uh, von Hamm, who is uh, not a stranger to the Explorers Club. He's actually a member of the Explorer Club, and he's been here giving lectures before. Uh, he came in from Germany yesterday. He's a researcher, an author, a photographer, uh, a curator, and he's spent, as you can tell from the title of the presentation tonight, he's spent at least 35 years unearthing treasures in uh, many parts of the world, but especially Asia, India, the Western Himalayas, and the Tibetan, the Tibetan region. And he's going to talk tonight about the Western Himalayas, and uh, he is a uh, not only a researcher, but a really a true explorer, a, a, an explorer in the modern sense. He uses photography, uh, wonderful writing, uh, to document uh, the um, the art and the truth and the mysteries and mandalas and all types of uh, exciting things that he uh, comes across. And some of those products you can see outside, some of the wonderful books that he has uh, published. And I did a little bit, a little bit of research, and he's, he's published 15 books, at least 15 books that I know of. Uh, he's been very active, uh, primarily in the German-speaking uh, world uh, with TV documentaries. Uh, he's been involved in talk shows and has published uh, his work, of course. Uh, one of his books that he's going to talk about tonight, I'm sure, and, and later this week, uh, about Alchi, about a, a Buddhist monastery 10,000 10, feet high in the Himalayas. The New York Review of Books calls it uh, one of the finest art books 
ever produced. And I think if you look at it, and I have it at home, I looked at it, it's, it's really magnificent. And he's going to talk about that, of course. Uh, he's been uh, supported by the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama for many years. He uh, is part of the Explorer Club, of course, the Royal Geographic Society, many, many other societies that are relevant in this field of exploration and um, science around the world. And uh, he's here in New York now for one week. It's really a cramped week. I thought a neurosurgeon has a busy schedule, but his schedule is much busier. Uh, he's here tonight, and then on Thursday, uh, he's going to open an exhibition at the Tibet House about uh, algae. And uh, we can show, and, and you, you should look at this video, please, uh, Alex, if you show the video. Uh, the photography that he's going to show is magnificent, and there's a uh, phase one uh, is here. They're gonna maybe you'll, I'm sure you'll talk about that much more. Uh, digital. <laughs> Quite magnificent. If you want to uh, want those at your home, uh, you can talk to him. I'm sure he can give you a yeah, special yeah, deal. <laughs> uh, and then on Friday, uh, he's doing a book signing with uh, uh, Rizzoli, uh, a book about mandalas, and that's going to be done with Matthew uh, DeSantis, who's also a member of the Explorer Club. And I think they're going to have a conversation on Friday. And Saturday, there's actually a workshop with Phase One. Uh, about high altitude photography. So you have a very, very busy schedule. And, and not only that, but I, I hear that you're going to keep us busy tonight, so you better stretch out your legs. I think the talk is going to be more than an hour, maybe 90 minutes. So, so. Oh, we, we, we it a bit. oh good. All right. Uh, but I'm sure it's going to be fascinating. And uh, so we, we, if we have time at the end, if we have time at the end, uh, there will be some, uh, there will be time for question and answers, of course. Uh, and anything else I need to say? No. That's it. All right. So, uh, Peter, uh, well, we had dinner last night, and he's also a musician. He's a drummer. And when I was 18 years old, we're, we're, I, I look older, but we're the same age. When I was 18 years old, I was uh, in L.A. Uh, for the first time in this country, and uh, my dream was to go to the Percussion Institute of Technology, become a drummer. And I never met anybody who actually did that, and he actually did that at the same time. He was there. It was a... So, so there are a lot of parallels here. So, Peter, thanks, thanks for being here. Thank you, Roger. Thank you very much, Anne, for introducing us, Roger and me, and uh, for the great introduction today. And um, it's, again, a great honor to be here and being supported by the Explorers Club because actually what you see here is part of the Explorers Club. Um, I got nominated to become a member or become a fellow because of the work there. Also my work on Northeastern India um, that I've been presenting I think four years ago here um, before COVID and we wanted to get this exhibition off the ground much earlier but then we all were you know, paused because of COVID. So now is the time, and I wanted to introduce you also to two gentlemen who are also here tonight from phase one, uh, Paul Mecca and uh, Wayne, what's your last name again? Excuse me? Okay, you heard it, right? <laughs> I didn't hear it. <laughs> Wayne and Paul, right? Wayne and Paul are here tonight because it's for them that this exhibition that I hope you're going to uh, come to on Thursday or until the 3rd of July, if you don't have time on Thursday, is only because of this camera that you can see over here. And I feel really, really, really privileged to have worked with that. And I'm really thankful because I used to do analog photography before that. But with this one, one of those cameras is around, with, with, an, with the lenses that I used were around $60,000. So I will never own that. They gave it to me to use it in those uh, difficult circumstances that I'm going to talk about on Saturday. Um, so it was amazing to be using that, and I hope that we will have other projects together, and I'm sure we will. 
And you will see parts of it today, but why we showed you this small clip was because the speciality of this exhibition, it's not just a photo exhibition, it's actually we turned the Tibet house into that monastery because the way I photographed was, it was all aligned, you know, all the paintings, all, all the walls were photographed one side by side, one photograph next to the other, so that in the end we would have a documentation that can be hung on any wall and you know we had to make it tailor-made for, for, for the circumstances there. But the quality of this camera, it has a, it has a, you know, as I'm saying, I don't own it, I will not get it, so I'm promoting it only because it's such a great technical achievement that is there and it, the people are so great um, to work with. Um, it has a sensor for those of you who um, are versed in photography. Normal sensors of cameras have like 30 megapixels, and they produce, you know, prints 30 to 40 centimeters high. But this one has, hun the first one that I used had 100 megapixel, and that produces in a printing resolution that you have in books, 300 dpi, photographs which are one meter high and 75 meters wide, or vice versa. And now they have come up with a sensor that's 150 megapixel. So what we could do in the Tibet house where the walls were 3.5 meters high, we just had to enlarge them two times, and then we had the walls there. So we could, I mean, people in photography magazines say, come on, this is not necessary. You don't need this resolution. Yeah, you do. Because on Saturday, when you come to the workshop, we will find out. Now we will start with the lecture. Thank you for coming, and I hope you have a good evening and a good time. Thank you. Oh, I'm still in charge, okay. In the summer of 1987, I set out on a journey which was supposed or was about to change my life for the rest of my life. In the region, in the northwest frontier of India, the northwest border, there were regions that were closed for 60 years for any foreign access. They brought you directly to the Tibetan border had been sealed off for the last 60 years because of Chinese infiltration into Tibet and the Indian army being present there with more than one million soldiers to defend their territory. It was some of the worst highways that I've ever been riding on. But some of the most amazing experiences I could ever imagine. Around 30 journeys altogether now, but always with people who were admirably friendly, helpful, and proud of their cultural heritage. In what village would you be welcomed as the first foreigner to ever set foot on their territory? Something is hidden. Go. Discover it. Something is hidden behind the mountain change and it lies waiting there for you. Go. This famous saying or poem by 
the uh, famous um, novelist Rudyard Kipling who gave us the Jungle Books, Kim and other great stories, had become my motto ever since 1987, since I started out on my first journey to the Himalayas. And my quest or my idea was also to find places where um, local life had been quite unchanged and where else could that have been possible as in re regions that had been closed for 60 years for any foreign access. Where I worked was, or I still work, was as I said in the northwest part of India, bordering Tibet and Pakistan, so regions which are, you know, politically quite unstable, and there's always, you know, conflicts happening there. That's why they were sealed off, but um, the Indian government then also decided to have patches of it open for small groups uh, with uh, special permissions to travel up there. And uh, in 1987 was my first journey there, and uh, after an exhausting 18 hours ride in a bus, this was the first photograph I took of the Himalayas in a, in a, in a landscape or in a, in a part of the country called Lahul. And Lahul was a place, which I later found out, where a very interesting person, a painter, philosopher, um, traveled in on his search to the mystic land of Shambhala. And he's a neighbor of yours because his museum is just right around the corner, Nikolas Rurik, a mystic um, Russian painter who lived just beyond these mountains in the Kulu Valley. And, you know, I was thrilled to find out that his, this painting shows exactly, painting in 1910, what I had photographed 77 years later. Mine was a little cloudy, but you could see on the side, you see the glacier and the, the mountain peaks there. So I took that as a sign because, um, you know, this landscape and, and the exploration work that I did there started something in me which I didn't know existed. And, you know, I didn't know I, that I wanted to be photographing the world, that I want to write about it. And I would have never done this hadn't it been for the, for the experiences that I had. And um, I will tell you some about them while we're going on. My journeys mostly start at Simla, which is the uh, former summer capital of the British when they were ruling India in the colonial times. Uh, that has changed considerably, of course, but some of that flair is still there um, in a good sense. You know, today we have to be careful with what we say about these times. Um, maybe that picture is still there. No, I don't have it. I had to cut the presentation a little bit. But you can still, you know, there, there's a ridge there, there's a mall there, and when you, when you travel there, it's a bit like walking in, in, in British times in India. And most of the journeys end in Ladakh, in Leh, in the, the capital of Ladakh, from where um, caravan routes went into Central Asia, and which was like a big um, exchange place for caravans coming from India, caravans coming from Central Asia. And I found that quite um, similar to what it was in the old photographs. Um, now, of course, it's a very touristic place. It's a bit like Kathmandu, um, not, as, not as frequented as Kathmandu, because this is on 3,600 meters. So um, a lot of people want to go, but if they don't acclimatize, they're gone earlier than they have been there, you know. The way we traveled um, is again, this whole lecture will be, you know, historic photographs next side by side with uh, modern ones because this is what I experienced. And there was not much difference and I love that. If you go to a place and it's not run down, it's not rotten and it's almost untouched from, from um, other influences. And what you see here is part of that caravan route that I described. It's the Hindustan-Tibet road which went along this um, border region and then set off into Tibet, which is now impossible to go there. And when I traveled there, I didn't know of that photograph. It comes from um, a gentleman who photographed it in 1866, I think. Um, and when I was there, there wasn't much change except for that 
nose of rock had been, you know, blasted off, but the handle of that road was gone. So I don't know <laughs> if they expected we didn't need that anymore. <laughs> yeah, then now they come with jeeps; they don't need those handles anymore. <laughs> But you must imagine that people, the, 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 the caravans and the carriers, they went on these routes uh, on foot to come uh, to bring whatever rice or whatever up to, to uh, Central Asia. And the ridge is about 2,000 meters high. Uh, when you drop down, it takes a while till you reach the Sutledge Valley. <laughs> Traveling was a bit different, I must admit, but not very much better. Sometimes I would have wished to have a horse instead of a jeep like that, which, you know, the profile of the wheels were almost like when you go swimming and you put this rubber thing around you when you can't swim. And, but at the time, it was the only device we could find. In 1993, I was able to access that area, 87. I tried, and then I was, you know, kicked out of the region because I didn't have a permit. And in 1993, I placed an ad in an adventure magazine, and I met a friend of mine, or became a friend of mine, and we set out together. And this was the only Jeep which was not available in Simla, but it was carried up or driven up from the, from the lowlands, from India. And I went to the Department of Tourism. They told me Simla is like a, a, a wedding place. And the guy told me that, you should you know, get a boat and row on the boat and with your friend here and have a nice time. Why do you want to go to these places? Nobody goes there. <laughs> I said, okay, I have to go there. Now I know. <clears throat> yep, 1909, Bridges, photographed by uh, August Hermann Franke, who was a German missionary, um, who was the first who did an exhibition, uh, expedition sorry, on the cultural heritage of the place. It was the first non-political expedition in the Western Himalayas, where the, the um, government of India um, archaeological service you know, set him out after they knew about Ajanta, about the Taj Mahal, and all these you know, well-known places. What can we find at our borders and not talk about how can we expand them in the great game, as you probably know it, you know, the spying activities between Russia, China, and England. But they wanted to know what is there that we have to administer you know, when, we, when we put our troops there. And our bridges were much different. And it's true, the, the old uh, cliche that when you press the handles, they go down, and you stand there, and you tend to fall into the river because you don't have anything to attach to anymore. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> so these are other bridges which are you know, good places for people who are suicidal. <laughs> also photographed by Franke that you see, is it this one down here? Of course, with tropical helmet. Those were still there in 1993. And they wholeheartedly invited me, come join us, we go to this valley. And said, no, I have to go this way. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. But that was not all. I mean, adventure is fine, fair and well, and, and great, and, and uh, lucky if you don't have to be too adventurous. As I said, we used the Jeep, which was adventurous in itself. I fell ill because of all the dust that came through, you know, the canvas cover that we had and, you know, the drivers, all the, all the, all the stories you hear in old travel diaries or exploration reports that the crew tends to run away. It was, it's true, believe me, it's true. And we had many places, and my first, I was very lucky to write my first book as a travel account, unfortunately only in German so far. But, um, you know, when, when you wake up in the morning with, in your tent and your driver is gone, <laughs> and you're, it doesn't matter if he runs a camel and the camel is gone or the jeep is gone, it's gone. You, you have to find out how are you gonna, what are you going to do next now, where are you going to go, where can you get him. And there was no communication, nothing. But my background is more on the cultural side. And you know, this is the local architecture in the foothills, which is unrivaled, which is, it doesn't have any you know, parallel. Maybe in Austria there are some 
in places where they use slate shingle, uh, 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 shingle roofs, and uh, then you have um, carved verandas, and then stone and uh, cedar wood um, uh, basements, um, or the bases below. Um, untouched, fairly untouched. I can, if I can go back. Is that working? No. Um, one of the towers collapsed, and that was done new, but it was done better than the old one. It was really done more um, with more carvings and more um, fine carvings done. So, you know, change can sometimes be for the better. And the way the people um, revere their de deities is very special there. They have a cult called the Mora cult, where all the, they have like hundreds of, of um, animistic deities there, and they're revered as, as um, busts, bronze busts, called moras, and those were still there, and they still are, and in fact, um, that is one of the projects that I'm discussing with phase one. I would like to document the remaining temples with, uh, they have a camera especially for architecture, um, because they're about to be destroyed, because the people have become very rich because of Apple, uh, cultivation that they're doing now for India that comes once a year to pick up the pick up the um, harvest, and so they've destroyed practically most of their of their um, ancient architecture, including uh, the temples. Um, rituals were strong in there. This is the historic pendant to what was on the internet for um, promoting this event tonight. Um, we were, or I was among the first or the only ones to discover this ritual again. It was um, performed in Lhasa once a year for the New, new Year festivals. And um, I was there with a TV team in 1999, and we had the privilege to document that. And I will show you a short film clip of that now. This is the desolate mountain desert of Spiti. Spiti is a region which is right at the border to Tibet. It's called Middle Land, land between India and Tibet. Not only is the main valley desolate, but the side valleys are even more desolate. And there, the cliche is true that old things have preserved even much better architecture, but also the mentality and the hearts of the people. And if there's... Horse of Shah, usually they call. One big storm is put here, and then uh, uh, a crash, is that, that, uh, that stone. That is the uh, usually people who have some training of uh, breathing control, control, I mean, breathing control. And then... Uh, 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 so in order to show they are sort of the training, usually that kind of things so happen, do. So uh, that, I think, part of uh, tantric practice. What His Holiness was referring to is that ritual that we see. When there's evil in the land, it has to be sent away. And the way that it's done, they take one big stone from a river and place it onto the chest of one of those tantric monks. And the evil is placed onto the stone, and then eventually the stone gets crashed with another stone. And first I thought this is like, okay, hocus pocus as we say in German. But the amazing thing was, and then I will let you enjoy the ritual without my words, that when the stone was crashed, all the people looked in the same direction. I didn't see anything, but they did. So I was quite amazed. Maybe they said, let's look to the right side, but you never know. And it takes place with a lot of theatrical performance. And it's a play that actually comes from Bhutan, but was, you know, is lost there. And the, the Bhutan lamas, they are minstrels that travel around the Himalayas and show it wherever there is something 
that they have to get rid of. The founder of it was Tang Tong Gyalpo, who is also responsible for the iron chain bridges in Tibet. And they show the demons that they're strong and they put needles in their skins and needles through their mouth. He was the master and his, the other guy was really bleeding badly because he wasn't so profound in this practice. Sometimes the demon even leaves when he sees the shaman or the tantric monk doing these things. Then come, then come the sabers. Still didn't want to leave. By then, they were in trance. Many archaic things are still preserved in that part of the world and the background is also is, uh, to be felt or to be seen everywhere, like with prehistoric rock carvings um, that are still quite enigmatic because we really don't know, oh, we thought we didn't know, or before we didn't know, before I came we didn't know, <laughs> they didn't know what, wh where they're from, but that was also truly a discovery there. Um, only in 2008 I was, you know, getting closer to a solution of this because it's ibex most of the time and the ibex had a special significance but there are not so many ibexes in the western Himalayas and so there had to be some more of a spiritual significance to it and those are everywhere in, in many places and not only in pasture parts but also like around villages and in 2008, I was, you know, a, a journalist from German TV went with me to one of these areas, and I will show you what we discovered there. This is an area called Dahanu, which is very close to the Pakistan border, and it has been only been opened for the public for groups around 10 years ago. And I researched there because um, 
I heard that they were the last remaining Indo-Aryan populations, the one that brought Brahmanism to India and uh, remaining there in the original form. And most of the ibex carvings are found there, among them. And through other travels I could find out that um, their settling area used to be much larger than only um, secluded to this small valley there. They even have altars with these um, ibexes. And the ibex is the animal of Mung Shri Men. Mung Shri Men is the fairy god of fertility, you could say. So every time somebody hunts an ibex, he, he um, draws this or makes this carving and puts the horns on that um, altar. But it has to do with cleanliness, with what the Brahmin religion also in India taboos and you know, you cannot be touched if you are Brahmin by other parts of the, of the society. But the amazing thing is those people don't look Indian or Tibetan at all. They look like Romanians, Bulgarians, people from the Caucasus, people from the Balkan. And we even saw people with green and blue eyes up there. You all know this famous photograph by Steve Curry of the Afghan woman. It's a bit like that. Now these are brown eyes, of course, but... The beautiful eyes. What these people admire the most are flowers, because flowers are brought by the shepherds after the summer pastures are over from the high mountains, given to the women, and they have a strong significance. Yeah. Here's one with the green gray eyes. And the people are called Minaro. And they're still very mysterious. They have a different language and they have words which are Greek, French. One village is called Pardos, which is like a Greek name. Lastions, which is like a French name. So everything we know, Indo-European languages, everything is preserved among them. And in 2009, I made an exhi expedition, exhibition on these Western Himalayan regions. And we also included the Minaro with their wonderful dresses. Problematic is they are like a side group in Ladakh and you know not really integrated and about to be losing their cultural identity unfortunately. The, wa the paths were not as bad as this one that we traveled on. That's why we could photograph it. But you know um, Nature was, of course, immense, but not as immense anymore in terms of glaciers than it was photographed by Heinrich Harre in the 19, late 1970s. This is a glacier on the way to Sanskar, which is a region in the western Himalayas close to Ladakh. When we saw it, it was this. So wherever you go, you are confronted with, unfortunately, climate change and the devastating um, results that it has. And it will be even worse for the people up in the Himalayas who are depending on the glaciers for irrigation their fields of their fields. And uh, we know in northern Nepal, people are already coming down from the high settlements that they have because the glaciers are gone. For me, this was a place, you know, where I could also discover many things about myself, about my interests, and about my spiritual orientation. 
And this photograph, to me, was always the most intense and most revealing photograph of a person in search of something, looking for something that he might not know. Something is hidden behind the wall, behind the high mountains. And I loved it so much that we staged it <laughs> around 60 years later. Um, we were there for a day, and in the evening we came and we saw the light was totally different, and then the next morning we staged it and a dream come true. The monastery hadn't changed much, as hadn't much of the other places. This is Dunkar, which is the former capital of the Spiti Valley, Spiti Kingdom. They had no-nos, they were calling them uh, kings. Um, who came from West Tibet, and they had a Western Tibetan, or they have a Western Tibetan language. An hour was just two, two more jeeps being placed there, the rest was the same. Some monasteries had changed, they have huge monasteries there, the key monastery, for example, um, that after 1909 suffered an earthquake, now still impressive, but all completely rebuilt. Um, the population generally is Buddhist up there in the, in the high hills. And in fact, that region, Spiti region, was one of the uh, most Buddhist uh, region in the world, not because they were so uh, intensely devoted to Buddhism, but there were so few people that the percentage of people being in clergy and monkhood was higher than in Tibet itself. It still is. And this is the favorite place of the Dalai Lama when he wants to retire. And also this is another thing that happened to me. I don't know why, but it didn't happen to anybody else. These are the only film um, things of the monastery that he loves the most, the way he's going to retire, at least that's what he said. And this is my dream, my spiritual dream, so to say, of that region, because it is a mandala which is three-dimensional, you come into the main room of the monastery and you become the center of this mandala. And this is from the late 10th, early 11th century. So at that time already it was clear that a mandala is not just a painting of a perfected world with gods and deities somewhere around, but it represents a psychogram of yourself and in which way you can evolve or maybe even reach enlightenment like that. So. This is an old photograph of these um, sculptures that are placed on the wall, Kashmiri style from the 11th century, very rare. When I came there, it was just in color, that's all, no difference. And here's the film. It's the Tabo Monastery, it's called. Not very much like the monasteries we know from Tibet. It was placed on even ground. And I came to understand that all these early monasteries were in the second propagation of Buddhism in Tibet in the 11th century and were all done by a, a builder and great translator called Lotsaba Rinchen Zangpo that I followed for the last 30 years in his achievements and his work. So it is believed that the aura of the figures is supposed to go down and help the monks in achieving their spiritual goals. I had the feeling of coming into the pyramids of Egypt, all painted and all in original state. story of the Buddha and of sages as motivation for the monks painted underneath 
below the statues. Place full of energy. And all around a silver painted or white main Buddha who looks in all directions and is like the structure or the substance of the world that emanates everything, including human beings. Um, I said it just now that I followed the footprints of Lodzava Rinch and Zangpo in the 11th century because these are the only places where this kind of art is, has been still preserved. And um, in Tibet it's all gone because of the destructions of the Red Army during the Cultural Revolution in Tibet. Um, in India, five or six are still in existence and I, I focused on some of them as monographs. One was the Tabo Monastery. Um, which you found outside, luckily or happily, they have been, has been sold. Um, if you're interested in that, you can contact me and I have still copies, some copies left. Um, they're very high priced on the internet. I think the other book that I did on Google on the West Tibetan Kingdom is around $5,000 now on the internet. So I'm not getting anything, so <laughs> it's just the antiquarian dealer that, you know, but it's very rare, and it was 3,000 copies was the edition, and now I don't know why, but that's the price, the going rate. Another discovery, really a discovery, was that I was you know, lucky to discover the most ancient paintings of the Ladakh region um, that they had been seen before, but they could not be actually analyzed in terms of dating or when they were furnished. Uh, that was only possible because the other areas in the Western Himalayas recently had been open and I had been traveling there and had the comparison with the other, uh, other. Those are not very good photographs, but they're eminently important out of art historic reasons. And they're similar to, to uh, paintings which are found in a monastery where they are better preserved, not very good, but better preserved. And they... Um, directly go back, and you could uh, date it also from the historiography um, of West Tibet, of the activities of this great translator and and uh, mount, uh, monastery builder Rinchen Zangpo. Like style-wise, you could you can see the way the hair is done. You can see the crowns. You can see the way um, the outlines, the shading is done, the eye form. And uh, we could estimate that these paintings were done 1042, so 50 years earlier than uh, what you will later see as the Alchi Monastery. Another identification point was the Ushnisha, which is the, the, the top of the head, which is only an old Rinchen Zangpo Monastery that it has like three antennas on top, even more. And uh, we discovered a manuscript from the 11th century in a, in a town with a wonderful name called Pu. Um, I left that out for tonight, but uh, that is also in the Google book, which has also been sold just now. Another thing that led to my latest things was, um, latest documentation, was to find a monastery that is very close to the Alchi monastery that was also done in the late early uh, 11th century by the same person who founded Alchi. And the amazing thing was that it has fantastic artworks that had never been documented before, although people were traveling to Ladakh since 1974. And I was always wondering, that that is one of my um, things in life. I was like, why don't we have books about that? Why is nobody doing that? And I wait for like five or six years, and then I set out and do it myself. Um, because I th it's, it's really important to do this kind of work, this documentation work, because that monastery was supposed to be renovated by, a, by an initiative in India that is you know, known for architectural renovation, but they forgot to put a cover on the wall, and then the roof collapsed, and all the dirt and all the soot and all the straw went onto the to the paintings, and those paintings are gone now. They're not in existence anymore. And I said, this is like what the Buddhists say about human ignorance.
It's really terrible. And um, luckily, Alchi is still there. That's why we did the project. And um, we hope that eventually we will, you know, create more awareness, especially among the people themselves in Alchi and the monasteries, that this is something very, very special and unique that you don't find anywhere in the world anymore, besides those five monasteries, that something must be done to preserve them. Mandalas, which are like six meters high and, and feature hundreds of deities. And historic paintings, which are you know unique because they show Tibetan kings in cross cultural uh, um, cultural cross dressing, as they call it. They wear dress from other people of the empire that they ruled um, as a sign of respect, but also of you know uh, sovereignty over them. And you can find influences from Iran, from Central Asia, up until Greece in these paintings, which were all coming from the Silk Road via you know, being preserved in cultural memory from Alexander the Great, who was you know, the last thing he achieved that was you know, in Pakistan and Afghanistan. He um, established the Gandhara Kingdom, where Buddhist art for the first time was shown in figural form. Before that, the Buddha was not shown like that. So you practically, you, most of you will know these heraldic, heraldic lions that are around. That it's like in our medieval times. These are Sogdian, Sasanian uh, symbols that we have also in, in um, Western um, culture. So this for, for the end for tonight, because of the time. This is the Alchi Monastery. This is what the great exhibition at Tibet House will be about. It's again like the Tabu Monastery placed in the valley. It's not on a monolith mountain. At that time, the monks were still dependent on the society around them to support them. And again, it's a treasure trove of amazing art that is uh, unavailable in that quality. This is like the best Tibetan art you can find in the world. Has um, uh, threw it out, I think, has uh, six temples and three are from the 11th century. And there you can see the Greek influence. It's like Greek pillars with uh, um, the Ionian capitals. Then it has an architrave. It has the, the, the uh, threefold um, pillars up there. And it has even the teeth decoration that you find on Greek temples. And there are no wooden temples surviving in Greece, but we have a lot of stone temples, so they can be you know, um, compared with that. So the only remaining Greek wooden temple is in the Himalayas. <laughs> and when you enter, you have three main monumental colossal st statues, which are 4.6 meters high, and um, they represent wisdom and compassion as the main principles of Buddhism. And the third one in the middle between them will be the one who has unified wisdom and compassion and will be the next Buddha that comes, the enlightened being that has you know, maximized that and has completely understood the two principles and lives them. The Maitreya statue then in the middle. And they are so high that, you know, first of all, I thought, Oh, you see that later. They, their, their heads peek out into the second floor. But the great thing is that the paintings on their dhotis, their, their sarongs or their, their, their trousers, so to say, they have been painted with miniature paintings. And for that, that camera was also, you will see, amazing, um, which has this from a, from, a, from a neighboring kingdom, the first Islamic kingdom, that was coming up in the Western Himalayas, the Ghaznavid Kingdom, where the Guga kings were planning actually to attack. But as a sign of goodwill, they already you know, incorporated the falcon hunt into their paintings. This is the, uh, next to that is the Guga king coming with his ministers to Ladakh to bring Buddhism to Ladakh. So the, 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 Analyzation of these paintings was done with a Tibetologist from New York. 
Amy Heller, who lives now in Switzerland, and we did it together, and um, it's quite reliable, I think. And there again, you have these roundels, which you find in Sasanian, Sogdian costumes, which came from Venice up to Japan. And here you have them as wall paintings, and those were supposed to imitate cloth strips. You find them at emperors or, or um, rulers clothes. A strange mixture of, of Central Asian parts, um, but also um, Turkish parts that there's a professor from New York University who was writing on cultural cross-dressing and he had a great article out called A Turk in the Dukang. Dukang is the assembly hall because he interpreted this as a Turkish costume but it's actually Central Asian and he agreed to that um, and uh, it came via the Silk Road and it is a sign for the Tibetan rulers that once the Tibetan Empire included also Central Asia parts of that that they feel they still feel there's a sovereignty over these regions. We discovered strange iconography, that's a bit too far now, that we could compare with uh, Iranian um, Zoroastrian numismatics, where you have the same this is like the, the god of the hearth of the of the um, um, making iron, where he has the tongs in his hands, very difficult to see, and the hammer on the other side. And there he is revered, which I didn't know before, as a, a security against fire. So there must have been some, some incident there when the temple was built. And another very interesting, very interesting sociological thing we could discover through inscriptions. What you see here is an assembly around the Buddha. And you have side by side male and female figures who are dressed alike. And those are bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas are beings that are supposed to be enlightened. And nowhere has have females, female figures been um, depicted as in the same rank as male figures. There's a long discussion in Buddhism if female have the same status in terms of religiosity, uh, religion and you know, finding um, as a Buddhist nun, getting the same, uh, being able to take the same vows, and that way finding the same amount or the same degree of an enlightenment. And there's a text in Alchi that says that. And it was amazing because in 2004 there was a seminar in Hamburg where they were finding Mahayana text from Korea where it was written like that. And that made a big fuzz in the Tibetan and Buddhist world that the standard of women has to be changed because it has been wrong for the last 1,000 years or so. And now with the Tibetan finding, the Dalai Lama immediately say, oh, then we have to change. <laughs> <laughs> so he was very open, but the thing is he's very easy to change because he cannot decide. It's a question of church right and depends on the group where they are. But never, this is too much, this goes too much into detail, but this is a really astonishing find and a reason why this place should be preserved, if, if not for anything else. Okay, they are the, the um, they called Rinpoche. If somebody is familiar with you with the, with the terms, a Rinpoche is a highly reborn person and a Rinmo, uh, male person and a Rinmoche is a female highly reborn person. Females are revered very, very strongly in Alchi. I'm almost two. If you're leaving, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> um, the green Tara um, is present, and you have these wonderful side figures that show Kashmiri dress from the 11th century. They're all running towards her. When you come to the exhibition, you can see her in life size, and it's fantastically painted, these figures are no bigger than this size, and the, the finesse and the, the amount of shading that makes it an illusionary appeal of being three-dimensional is just unbelievable. And like assemblies like this where you have hundreds of figures being there, it must have taken years to get this uh, monastery painted. And the green Tara that we use as also, of course, uh, the, the, the poster of the exhibition. Um, and 
That brings me mostly to the end, but we're not completely finished yet because this is what you're going to experience almost when you come to the exhibition. <laughs> Thanks to phase one cameras. Um, this is what it's going to be. This is what it's going to look like. This is just a computer-based draw, um, um, sketch or uh, design that I made, but it's actually like that. Um, it's opening on Thursday at six. I was told not six thirty, but we'll be th there longer. So um, on Saturday is the workshop where you will have more time to experience those cameras yourself if you're interested in photography. Uh, Wayne and Paula here today, you can have a quick look later when we're over um, at, the, um, at the cameras. Those are the ones. F and V was the other company that I was working with with the amazing lights, the LED lights that they make. And on Thursday is the, uh, Friday is the presentation of my new book at Tibet House in collaboration with Rizzoli. Um, also at six, it's on Mandala in Search of Enlightenment. It's on um, sacred geometry in the spiritual arts of the world. So trying to get into what a mandala means by going beyond Tibet and India and finding the structures, the geometry for expressing sacred uh, content also in all religions, all spiritual traditions in the world. Because if there's something that you cannot talk about, you come to the symbolic level. So this is a thing that real quickly uh, stated that unites us human beings everywhere in the world, that if we want to talk about God and cannot, then we use a triangle or a square or a, or a um, circle. So this will be in conversation with a fellow of ours, Matthew Ardisantis, who runs the Bhutan chapter of uh, the Explorers Club. He's coming on Thursday and or on Friday. I hope he won't be delayed at the airport. And he's very happy to do this together with me. It's going to be in an interview form, and I'm going to show some uh, assortment of, of images for you to see the book. It has 600 images. I'm not going to show all of them. And has 400 pages, so um, more detail, of course, than in the book. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will leave you with these last images. Thank you so much for a fantastic, wonderful presentation. And uh, yeah, take a deep breath, stretch out if you, uh, if you need to. And uh, we have a few more minutes for questions and answers. Anne is going to uh, bring you the microphone. And while, uh, please indicate if you have any questions, Anne is in the back. Maybe while we're waiting for the first question, I'll ask you uh, a question. You mentioned uh, with Alci at the end, you mentioned it must have taken years, but I was wondering when the artists or the um, artisans, when they were producing the paintings, was that a concert, was that a planned concerted effort or was this something that happens, happened over hundreds of years and was painted and overpainted or was this something that was planned and kind of executed the way that somebody was orchestrating it? 
Good question. Um, Tibetan art is not art. It is an expression of a philosophy. And what you see in these monasteries actually expresses a concept. It expresses, for example, the philosophy that I just mentioned, that you have wisdom and compassion. Those two together will lead to enlightenment if those are combined to the maximum. So the first idea to you know, make a temple where you have those three principles, it's quite clear, actually, and quite basic. Um, sometimes those are in paintings. Sometimes these are like in, in, in those days in, in sculptures. But certainly they are also more you know, in deeper, uh, even deeper cosmic speculations that you know, started to evolve in Mahayana Buddhism, especially in Tibetan Buddhism. And then, like, there are hundreds of mandalas, for example, or hundreds of ideas. So what you do then is you use a scripture. You have a text that you feel expresses best what you want to, um, what you want the monks or anybody who goes, follows this path to, um, to understand. So the paintings actually show the truth according to the Buddhist dharma, the Buddhist ideas. And naturally then you have a certain amount of space and then you say, okay, we need to put, for example, in the first, uh, second floor of Alchi, there's 10 mandalas there, four main ones and then around them other ones. And so then these are drawn and this is calculated, you have so much space, it's really architectural work actually, and um, interior architecture because they have to work with the space. And then sometimes you have, or there's space left over, like if you make 10 circles, naturally you have those corners in between. And then you have space to make other statements, like you, you put, place the Bodhisattva of wisdom, or you place a wish-fulfilling, granting um, female deity there. Because you would need that for your efforts in meditation or in attaining some higher form of consciousness. So everything has been laid out, everything has been planned before. Nevertheless, the artists were able to place their signature on these paintings. It's, you can find in Alchi Monastery, for example, or even more in Tabo, but let's stay there if we have a temple where that has been you know, furnished in five years, let's put it that way, you still have uh, workshops that you can really identify, which have a total different style of drawing, although they're all in the uh, Kashmiri, West Tibetan style. But you can see from the brush, and you can see, again, because of the documentation, which brings out the details so well, that some, maybe some artist was left-handed even, you know. He did something that uh, the other artists would, ne would have never done. And so that makes it very interesting. We will never know who they were. They, it only started to be that artists you know, painted, signed their paintings in Nepal in the 15th or 16th century, when the Nepali went to Tibet, because they were asked to come, because they, those were the greatest painters at that time. But in, in, in the 11th century, it was not common. So to summarize your question, yes, it was all laid out, and it, had all, it all had a meaning. Spaces that were left open were left for donors, you know, people that supported, patrons that paid for all this. You know, you had to have Kashmiri artists coming into Ladakh. They had to be paid. You know, they stayed there for years in, in circumstances with minus 40 degrees uh, Celsius. Maybe they went down even, I don't know exactly. But they stayed long and it was unknown to them. It was not their home. So, I think they earned quite a, quite a sum of money and it was not just work for a better reincarnation, but those were artists that were famous at that time also. And so Rinchen Zangpo, he went to Kashmir and said, I want this workshop to come here and paint this monastery for me because he knew who were the good artists. Yeah. And there, I'm so, one second, just the last, last sentence, there the artists were painting what the donors wanted. Like they say, okay, I want to pray to Tara, play it, uh, make me a Tara painting there. And then they made this in their um, unimaginable finesse and, 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 and great other questions. 
Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm just wondering, throughout history, I'm over here. Oh, okay. Yeah, throughout history, um, what would the artists use as color pigmentation, and did that change? Um, and would they make it themselves? Good question. The color pigmentation we're quite aware of. There had been research also on this in the 80s. We have a, a German um, a University of Applied Sciences in Cologne that was doing research on algae before. It just that hadn't been possible since then. And they had art history students there that were taking samples. And we know that, for example, the blue is um, turquoise from Afghanistan. So most of the paintings, or most of the pigments used were really also the very expensive ones. And I, I just have it in mind that it's turquoise, it's, wie heißt das ganz dunkelblaue Stein? I'm happy I can speak German with him. <laughs> What's the name of the very dark blue? Lapis. Exactly, Lapis was there, yeah, that's true. And uh, they do, and even you know, maybe on some of the other um, paintings you saw that there were, there was um, lead placed on, pastilla it's called in, in art history, lead that was placed around the, the mandalas, the compartments of the mandalas, and this would, um, had uh, gold pigments on it. So that's why some of these monasteries were also, like in Egypt, I said in one of the films, it felt like coming to Egypt to a pyramid. Some of these were hacked out because the people that you know, destroyed them thought it was real gold. You know? So they really had the feeling they wanted to show the beauty and the, of, of the wisdom that they had discovered. Because it was, as I said, the second propagation of Buddhism. So everything was done in a very, very, very intense way. And yeah, of lapis I know and of turquoise I know. And that, of course, made it very expensive to do these temples. And that's why Alci, and there was a discussion about that, who made the temple, a Turk in the Dukang? Was it Central Asian people coming there, invading Ladakh and going back? Doesn't make sense. It's the West Tibetan kings, and, and another discovery in our research was Amy Heller found out that she could actually identify a name of a minister from whom we know at what time he lived. So the, the um, declaration of the dating is actually quite secure now to the end of the 11th century. Um, so I'm just curious, when you were speaking about being at that ceremony and you expressed uh, skepticism about everybody looked to the right at some point, but I don't know if that was choreographed. Obviously spending all these years kind of immersed in this stuff, how have you sort of balanced that more agnostic, scholarly approach versus being caught up in the spiritualism? Very good question, thank you. Um, I see myself as, a, um, an, as an observer. I don't judge anything, you know, I'm, I've come to travel, I mean, even more among the Naga people, if, you, if anybody of you was here um, when I did my lecture on headhunting in Northeast India, you cannot be more than an observer. And I think you, you owe it to the people that, uh, that you are privileged to be with that you're not supposed to judge, you know. You, you, if we think about headhunting, it's so far for us, but when you try to get deep into what it actually means, and the same with this ritual there, um, I can simply accept what I saw, and I believe in what I saw. I'm, I'm not taking it as, uh, as truth per se, because I didn't see it. You know, I didn't see anything uh, you know, lifting off from that stone. But for them, it's, it's right. For them, it's the truth. And this is what matters, because the people were relieved that the evil in their, in their valley was gone. They could believe, and that could make them heal. You know, sometimes it's the belief in healing that makes us heal. And the symptoms will be gone because, oh, we have the remedy now. The placebo effect, as we would say. But I would think it would be arrogant if, if I were, or anybody would, would start. It's just that as an ethnographer, which I see myself also not just an art history uh, documentation guy, it's observing and keep it like that. So now that we know that you're a musician as well, <laughs> Um, do you ever use the universal language of music um, along with these people that you're working with? Well, um, first of all, I observe that too. I'm, when I'm, I'm there, I'm you know, going to attend the service, so to say, which is always with music, but the monks get together and with their drums and their cymbals and their, 
um, and there are trumpets and all these things. Um, I find that music so, so attractive, you know. Um, it's sometimes difficult for me to um, leave my personal ears at home, although meditation music, of course, tends to be just one chord and very, oh, very deep and like that. Um, I heard some different percussion in there. Do you ever jam with them? <laughs> I did, actually. And uh, in Ladakh, there was a wedding, and, and in weddings, they hire musicians. And as a drummer, of course, there are drums, and there's Sean, so old uh, kind of trumpet-like or flute-like instruments that they play. And the one guy invited me, and he heard that I was drumming too. And I tried to play it in that style that he did, and the way they hold their drumsticks is completely different. They go like this, and you no, know, we, we have either the, the traditional grip, which is like that, or we have both of our sticks like that, but they went this way. And so when I started to use my Western grip, I got the first look. <laughs> <laughs> then when I changed the sticking, and I started to play, I got the second look, and I didn't want to have a third one. <laughs> because, you know, the rhythms that they do, they are so unique and so um, shaky. But this is the way they play. This is the style that they have. And it was more like, yeah, yeah, nice try. Go get a beer. <laughs> so my jamming was quite limited, actually. So we have a few questions online as well as many in the audience here. Uh, Donna is asking, when the glaciers die and the people must leave just to live, will the monasteries be abandoned? Say it again, I didn't put it. When the glaciers die and the people must leave just to live, will the monasteries be abandoned? I don't know. Um, I haven't heard of any such situation. What I know of is that in most of these countries or these parts or these, these, these landscapes or districts, so that might be the word. It's still that way that most of the time the second born son goes to the monastery because not, you know, the, the, tradition, the, the spiritual reason is that one learns to read and write and one may attain nirvana, may become, you know, free from this um, samsara that we are living in. The main idea behind it though is sociological in the sense that the family doesn't have to feed another mouth. Um, because the property is so limited in these high mountain deserts that you know, there's only so and so many people that survive from the crops that they have. Now, of course, this is much different because the, 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 the regions have opened to India. In Nepal, there's a big Chinese influence coming also from the north. And because of the military presence in Ladakh also, they get all the provisions from, from, uh, from India too. Tourism has started, people not just do farming anymore. But the tradition is still like that. And it's still very much prestigious to put a person into the monastery. And at the same time, give money to the monastery. You know, it's like a dowry that when you give a son, you also get a certain amount of money. And then also parts of the, of the crops will go to the monastery, like in our medieval times in Europe. Um, but I have never heard it that, you know, if some drought is there or some, some, some catastrophe that, you know, the, the monks uh, are emptied, that might be temporarily that, you know, monks, they, they have fields too, they work too, but um, that is done on a regular basis. I haven't heard that before. So in the Naga territory that's controlled by Myanmar, the Tatman Da, that's the military government, um, uh, organizes for high-end tourists a festival called the Hornbill Festival in early January. Mm -hmm. um, does it make sense to go to the Hornbill uh, Institute to pay to go to, to pay Buddhist fascists to go to a festival and display of animus, the animus Naga costumes and ritual dances? Does it make sense? What is your thinking about the Hornbill? Uh, and that kind of tourism. I tried to you know, put this question into the background that we're actually here on, on the Western Himalayas because there the same things happen. He's referring to a cultural festival that 
in the people in the northeast of India and in, in the Naga region have brought up by the Department of Tourism to showcase their culture. And that's practically what it is, and that is done in Ladakh also for the tourists, that has been done in Bali for 50 years, that is done in everywhere where you have a certain group that has a certain tradition, that has certain um, dresses that they want to display, and why people actually go there. I mean, this is, uh, we go because something is exotic, and we wouldn't go if it was the same that we had at home. So in that, that region, um, it's even more exotic because those people were, you know, fierce headhunters, and they still, some of them still are, and um, it's it's a kind of thing that is supposed, on the one hand, to unite the people, which had been on their throats for ages, and to create peace and 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 harmony, and also a, a feeling of unity among them. But it's a, it's a tourist thing. It's, you know, for people, it's on the 6th of December for a week. Everybody comes there, builds their own sheds, uh, morongs they call them, where the log drums are placed and all that. And you can see the whole, this is like, see Europe in one day. You know, when you go to Disneyland and, and you have, you know, or those miniature um, worlds where you can go and you go to Holland and you go to Brussels and you go to Frankfurt or wherever. And you have that all there. It's not the real thing. The people are real. I mean, they go there, but you know, I I go to the villages and experience it myself. And but it gives you a first impression of these people. That's for sure. And the other plus point, also in all cultural festivals, I think, and cultural performances, is that it keeps the culture alive because the impact that Western societies have on, as tourists and also other societies, not only Western, but you know, the, the countries they belong to, is so strong that you know, anything, I mean, we in Bavaria, we have these dances too. Yeah? You go to the Oktoberfest and hey, those people are still medieval, my God. <laughs> the leather pants and doing this, the kind of thing there, you know. So, no, nobody would say in Bavaria that they are we. But they would say we keep the tradition alive. We know how this dance works. Yeah? Still, they go to a factory or they work in, in an office or something like that. It's, it's a tourist thing. It's good for the preservation of the culture. If you want to experience real Naga culture, you should take the time to go to the villages because now it's open, the country, and go in the springtime when the spring festivals are on that they celebrate their um, crops or their sowing with, because then fertility has to be rising. Maybe you get be a part of a headhunt. You never know. <laughs> Over here. Uh, thanks for sharing your work. Thank you. Um, you described being one of the first Westerners to go into this, these areas in several decades. How did you come to have that opportunity, and how did you view the ethics and responsibility of being well, there were a lot of changes that I experienced as I started out you know, with, with one Jeep as a guy that was the first among some to be allowed access there. And, uh, you know, um, I have a friend there who does some you know, organizations of, of uh, tours. And after the first book, there were more people coming. But the regions where I went are quite remote and there's still is not much tourism there in comparison with Nepal, with Bhutan, or with, with uh, Ladakh up there, where amenities are found, where internet cafes are. So I don't have a bad temper about you know, writing about that, because you know, people that go through a 300-page travel account to find out what they might find in that region, they um, might be you know, the right tourists to go there, because they might learn about the attitude <coughs> that is necessary to be with the people. And that's the great thing about a travel account. You, you write about your experiences with the people and how the way you treated them led to the way they tra treated you. And if they were curious about you and it was all turned around, sometimes I had the feeling I was the discovered one because they hadn't seen Western people in 60 years. Yeah? That has changed a lot, you know, as I said before, in that Kinor region, all the houses are gone because, and that has nothing to do with me, that has to do with apple crops and people becoming millionaires, and people don't, they don't want to live 
on top of the, the, the sheds where the cows are and it smells and you know, they can be forgiven, of course. I mean, who would still want that? And uh, even in, in, in the Black Forest where we have the most um, traditional housing patterns in Germany or in Bavaria, people buy, uh, have you know, started to build separate sheds for the, for, the, for the animals and they have modern houses, they put still some grass on the roof because that's the traditional way of doing it. But change occurs and change happens and you know, nobody would accept that somebody tells us, no, it looks ugly, don't change your house. And says, no, I'll change my house. Yeah. But it's because I can. And you know, tradition many times, unfortunately, is a sign of poverty. And you know, as soon as people get, are better off, they change their attitude and change their lifestyle. It's just that way. And Okay. Hi. Uh, Hi. First of all, thank you so much. It was spectacular to thank see you your work. Thank you very much. Um, I had a comment and a question. Um, it's just so refreshing to see women uh, represented so beautifully and with such dignity and not objectified in such their goddess nature. It was really so nice to see that. Um, my question is about the Brahmin. Um, you had said that that would be disappearing, that culture. And you had also talked about, you used the word clean and they don't touch or something. Could you just talk a little bit about what that is? Sure. Um, first of all, Tibetan women have a great standing. I mean, that, that, uh, if, you, if you go to a bazaar and you see a shop, don't go there if there's a Tibetan woman inside because you will lose. You will not be able to negotiate a good price because <laughs> those women are tough, really. <laughs> Um, see a man, even if you're a woman, they will not be, be less tough if you as a woman go into a shop. So the natural um, setting of being female in that society and all the other societies that surround them, um, you know, beyond the high passes where the high altitude starts, is pretty similar everywhere. And I have done a movie on uh, a document, documentary on a, a, a wedding in Sanskar, and it was just so fascinating to see how the negotiations about the pride prize, how the women were doing that, and it was just great fun. And, and they were not, you know, in the end, the men paid all the prices in order to get the the woman for the for the for the groom that they were, you know, talking about or talking for. Um, that certainly is the mentality, and that is the, uh, the background for everything, how women are represented there. And that also is the background why they have been represented as bodhisattvas there. You know, th that, that makes absolute sense. Why should you deny uh, a woman something which, you know, if they're stronger than you, you, you know, it was done in our monks' societies in, in the medieval times, and the women, you know, they, 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 were, they were taking it, but the Tibetans' women would never take that. And it has changed. The nuns have a very bad standing now. I don't know what happened then. It must have been in the 15th, 16th century when Tibetan Buddhism was very much united that they made like, like a pope edict. I don't know if what Dalai Lama that was at the time to say, okay, this is it now. Females are not supposed to be enlightened. Regarding your other question, um, the Brahmin culture is highly um, centered on ritualism. The Brahmins were the ones who um, introduced a unified form of religion in India. And they placed themselves on the top of that. It had to do with power and with division of power. And the Brahmins were the ones, somehow, they united with the kings, as is typical, and then started the, to spread their religion, their idea. And the cleanliness is, you know, Gandhi was propagating the untouchables, because in India you have a caste system where on the lowest part you have people that are not supposed to be touched by nobody. Those are the ones that clean up the garbage, that do all the unclean work, uh, still do. I mean, this by the society or by the, by, um, it is said that this is over, but it's not. It's still there. And the, the idea is that an Aryan movement came from Central Asia. And that movement, um, you know, everything that 
Hitler did wrong at the time by, by saying the Aryans were this, this, this race of whatever, um, those are the Aryans, those are the ones that you know, are actually the background for also gypsy people in Romania and in Bulgaria. So he was, let's not talk about it, it was completely wrong. But the idea of the Aryans was that, and what they don't have there in that region, that's why I say it's, it's the original form, that cleanliness must be preserved. That has, we have that in all religions in the world. We cannot eat pork meat in that religion, we cannot eat beef in that religion, we cannot eat whatever, because it has to be cooked differently. That has to do with hygiene most of the time. But hygiene in religions is always substituted or something spiritual is put on top, so people do it actually. So people cook food in a special way, leave out certain diets and don't do it. And in that, in that um, society, it's a completely even society. They don't have any castes or any groups, but they bring the cleanliness from the hills, from the top of the mountains. They, they assort... Um, so let's leave it at cleanliness. The cleanliness is at the glaciers, at the white mountains. And this is where the, the, the shepherds actually go with the, f with the flock. And from there, in the, in, in the fall, they bring the flowers. And I, I was um, uniting with an ethnographer who was the only one who was doing research there in the 1980s. He's died, he died, unfortunately. But I have all this material now, and he researched intensely on them. And so they bring it, everything has to be clean after the year. We have those things too, like in, in carnival season, the new season starts, we have big noises and we have demon masks that we put on and then to throw away the winter like that and to start a new year. And, and for that, it has to be all clean. And other things happening to women, like they have to go to a certain place when they have their menstruation, for example. That is also there among them, you know, that um, then they have a very strict rule of who to s who's sitting where if um, like a woman menstruating cannot enter the house like that. And all these things, they have been intensified um, by the Brahmin caste in India. And it goes back to them, for example, the cow also, they don't eat any, any, any beef. Um, the reverence of the of the of the ibex. Not sure what what is left over in India there, but also language-wise, Sanskrit is very closely related to that que that language that they speak up there, like that. Okay, thank you. So you said they were disappearing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The disappearing aspect is this is a very small group that remains in this traditional form there in this small pocket, the Dahanu Valley, at the border of Pakistan. The, the other, the, the, the ethnic group they belong to are called the Darts. And Darts are assimilated in the more Islamic uh, societies that are around the Kargil district there. They're in Pakistan, the, um, also assimilated. And also as the Buddhists try to assimilate them. That's what makes their standing so difficult. Because to them they are just Drogpas. Drogpas means high pasture shepherds. And this is a de dero derogative word, so it puts the people down. And I think every, every uh, ethnic group has the right to be called by their name. And it was very hard for me, I traveled there quite often to find out, what, how do you call yourself? Oh, we're Drogba. No, that's, your, that's not your name. I know by so-and-so. Yes, we're Minaro, but we don't say it, because then we will not be accepted in the society that's around us. So, yeah, please. Can you speak? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. There you can. Can you speak to both the biological as well as the spiritual reason for no blood when these people pierced themselves? Uh, um, I think, uh, to be scientifically Western, um, it's not really a spiritual thing. It's practice. The more you pierce the parts of your um, of your cheeks, your blood will find a way around it. If you take the same part again and again, 
your, your vessels will go find another way. Am I right? <laughs> it's probably scar tissue. I was wondering, maybe you had a hole. Yeah, I mean, you, you get scars because uh, those things have to heal. And his apprentice that was with him, it was bleeding like hell. I didn't see that. Yeah, that was all in the film. We had an, uh, I have it in, 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 in photographs. So it's, purely, it's purely physio physical. It could be, you know, you have those fakirs and you have those things that people have body control. And His Holiness was talking about it. They said they have breathing control. I think that concerned more how can you stand a big rock being placed mm -hmm. on your chest mm -hmm. and somebody hitting it with another stone. That fakir, they have happens. fakirs there. That uh -huh. is the same practice. You know, fakirs is the name for it in, in, in India. When people stand for 30 years on one leg like that and they don't give up. I mean, you have to develop some certain uh, amount of spiritual strength in order to, to do that. That, yeah, that cushion was awesome, and, and I asked them, but the cushion was more because of um, a little bit to you know, prevent the shock of going there. And but the the, the stone, I mean, the, the, you you saw the pressure that was put on there. Yeah, maybe there's a modern fakirs. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again, this was outstanding. Thank you. You've spent 35 years traveling to these very strange and exotic places. What was the biggest challenge you encountered in that whole period? Mm. I'd say cold and diet. <laughs> <laughs> like one of the hardest things that I did, although I must say, during that time it was more the diet thing because when you do this kind of work or at least I experienced it that way you start to get into some extraordinary um, kind of consciousness we call it a flow state where you actually don't know what you're actually doing anymore or you're not conscious about it you know I really had many times the feeling when I was working so close I was privileged to work so close with what I had desired for such a long time to do I really started to feel one with the image that I was photographing. I was you know, running up ladders for 10 hours a day, fixing stands and, and not caring about that. Only like afterwards I, did I find out how much extra um, skin I generated, how much you know, weight I lost. You know, some, most of the time, I have to go back there again, by the way. <laughs> I'm losing about six kg in, in four weeks, so it's a good diet for people to do this kind of work. Um, but diet is something that you really, I mean, when you go to these remote places, what people eat there, now it's of course different, they have Indian food coming up, so it's quite good. But they used to live off samba, which is um, barley roasted and then placed into buttered and salted tea. That was the main diet of people in those valleys and in Tibet because it provided them with all the protein and all the necessities that they needed for this eight months of winter with minus degree, minus 30 degrees Celsius. And, but that in the morning, lunch and dinner, all the time. And the only vitamins they had were some, some apricots they were you know, um, harvesting and drying for the winter. And it was one of the few times that I really was not very nice and hospitable when we were chatting with, with people doing harvest. And, eh, we'll have some butter tea. And say, yeah, thank you very much. It was very good, you know. And then, you know, giving it back to Mother Earth so that the soil will become <laughs> fertile again. Because it was just very hard to take. And some people in, in the old travel accounts or ex expedition reports, they say, think of it as a chicken soup. I, I, <laughs> Especially when the butter had become, you know, not yellow but blue, and they, you know, did the tea with that, and it was like, okay, thank you. <laughs> so, we, we do have some people online, and I'm just going to go to one of them. Barry O'Reilly is asking, after the partition of India, did any of the monasteries end up in Pakistan, and if so, have they survived? Monasteries didn't end up in Pakistan, but um, castles were. Uh, before this was... Uh, um, Ladakh was, um, had a much wider um, 
range. Today, this region that, was, that used to be uh, um, Ladakh is called Baltistan, which is on the Pakistan side. But that is not so much partition, it is more to do with the Sikh invasion, which was in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, I'm sorry, around the end of the 19th century. And at that time, the, the Tibetan kings of Ladakh were already put aside, and the palace in Leh that you saw that is you know, deteriorated, that was from the time there. And at that time, because the Sikhs at the time, there were um, um, Muslim Sikhs, some of the rulers in Ladakh went to them and, and because they were Muslims themselves already. And that now, because of the separation, has made it completely uh, a Pakistan terrain. But it was not that they were forced to be in Pakistan because, and, and they were Buddhists and so they didn't feel at home. It's more the question, Kashmir is a bit more complicated because they have a lot of Hindu population also in Ka Kashmir, which makes the separation into a Pakistan part and a, and a, a, a Hindustan or Indian part more difficult than the region up there. So before I hand it back over to Roger, I want to thank you um, for everything tonight, but especially for bringing a very special woman along with you. And we became a family during COVID, especially an online family. And I want to bring Jenny Wilka Wipke up here, who's always online with us. Um, Jenny always has the best questions, and we're meeting each other for the first time in four years yes, today. Thank you um, Jenny's from Mauritius and also Princeton, New Jersey. And if it wasn't for you, she wouldn't be here tonight. So thank you so thank very Thank you very much. much. Okay. Did you have any questions? And she's a friend too, because she's an editor at Princeton University Press, and she edited for free my last book on mandalas, so um, that's true friendship, I must say. Really. And she's supporting my work also since many years, so thank you, Jenny, for everything you do. Peter, I can hear you, you're losing your voice, so we better, but th I'm sure this is not the last time that we uh, see you here at the Explorer Club in New York. We'll hear a lot about you, of course. We read your books and we'll admire your art for the rest of the week and the next years, I'm sure. So thanks again. And please take your time, have a look at the cameras. This is like a once in a lifetime thing. It was for me, hopefully it will be twice in a lifetime, three times in a lifetime. We'll discuss that. They're amazing. It's just wonderful that they are here. Thank you for coming also.